Um, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Tina, and the whole team at Women in the World. These panels have been so uh, powerful. Um, and I'm especially honored to be sitting with you, Raha, and you, Minky. Thanks for being here. Um, so we only have 15 minutes. Let's dive right in. Um, Minky, if you could first just sort of set the scene for us. Um, you know, we know it's illegal for Saudi women to drive, but it goes beyond that. Uh, children after a certain age, girls aren't allowed to play sports. They don't have access to physical education. Why is that? Human Rights Watch has done uh, several reports over the course of the last decade looking at male, the male guardianship system. That's one of the challenges. It puts restrictions on women's rights to travel, to work, to have education without the permission of a male guardian. That's one of the problems. The other is our 2010 report was called Steps of the Devil. And it, there's actually an attitude um, uh, among some of the hard, hardliners that exercise and sports will somehow lead to the downfall of women. Mm. And I think it's very important to challenge this. It's a, um, as you say, it's a matter of health. Um, Human Rights Watch has, in fact, done a number of interviews with Saudi women and girls who previously had an unhealthy lifestyle, they had depression, they had obesity, and through sports and exercise, they've been able to change their lives to access education and professional opportunity. Raha, despite being born into this world, at age 27, you successfully climbed <laughs> Mount Everest. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and 13 other peaks. <laughs> and 13 other peaks. Who's um, counting? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, for any woman, for any man in any part of the world, from any background, culture, country, that's near impossible. You had everything stacked against you. Why did you decide to pursue this? First of all, it's an honor to be here. I, I, I needed to pinch myself as I came up. Um, my story started when I reached a specific age in, in our culture. It differs from different families, uh, where I was expired. I did not get married, so my mom was really panicking and my father was really worried that I was living in another country at the time and I, I, I wasn't getting suitors and I needed to come back and, and try to follow the path. Um, and I just... When, when they told me that, I just, it, it blew my mind that in this day and age, I was still expected to quit my amazing job that I had, I was in advertising, and, and move, move back to Saudi and wait for Prince Charming to come and sweep me off my feet. I just, it didn't fit with me, it didn't fit with me at all, and I felt that I was destined for more than just walking this path. As fate might have it, I wasn't meant to walk a path at all, actually, I was meant to climb one. <laughs> As Minky mentioned, uh, this is a male-dominated society. How did you approach your dad with this idea? So in the beginning, uh, during this time when they were, my family was pulling me one direction, my soul was pulling me another direction, I didn't know what it was that I was meant to do. It w I had no idea what it is. So I kept searching, I kept trying to find a, a, a purpose, until randomly one day I stumbled upon someone who said she's climbing Kilimanjaro, and mm -hmm. It, it, it clicked with me, and I was terrified to even tell myself I'm going to climb this mountain, let alone my father. Mm. But the more I thought about it, the more I researched, I, I realized that this is what I was meant to do. I, I was meant to go beyond the, what was expected. Uh, and then finally, I, 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 I was afraid and everything in between. I, my love of adventure far exceeded my fear of rejection, and I decided to sit and, 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 and confront my dad. Thank God we were living in different countries at the time. It was a phone call. I did not want to see his face. Can you imagine any father, let alone an Arab father, to a daughter? And the question was, you know, I've, climbed, I've decided to climb the highest mountain in Africa since I have time off. The man just told me to get married a week ago. So it, it was, I think I shocked him into it. Of course, I got a very big, I, I call it a quiet no. He just said, no. And that's, that was the biggest invitation of my life, that I was like... <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. To, 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 you know, in, to respect my dad, I, I hung up and I, I didn't want to insult him, but it, it ate at me. This little word ate at me because he's the person, him and my mom, are the people that taught me that I can achieve anything I wanted. Yeah. Here you are now telling me I can't do this. I guarantee you that question would have been answered differently if I was born a boy. I guarantee. 
you've obviously climbed uh, Everest. You almost died climbing Denali, which is the highest mountain peak in North America. In some ways, was asking your dad that harder than these climbs? Uh, 14 expeditions, seven continents, and my hand on the send button is one of the scariest moments of my life, if you can imagine. And I've been in very, very hairy situations because I was so afraid to go against the grain, which is, I think, one of the big problems we have back home. Mm. Being different doesn't mean that you're wrong. Wanting to, do so wanting to follow a path, uh, in my case, a path that even men didn't want to follow down, doesn't make me uh, wrong or a shame or, 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 or an insult to my father. So I, I, I was terrified, mm -hmm. absolutely terrified. If you weren't allowed to climb, would you have been forced into an arranged marriage? Me, personally, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm too stubborn. <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of girls don't have the luxury I do. I have amazing parents that, despite being a very odd little girl, they loved me more than conformity. They loved me more than wanting me to fit like all the other girls. So they, ex they, they kind of put aside my quirks and, and, in the end, you know, as they say, loved one. Mm -hmm. What was it like climbing Everest, uh, eventually reaching the top after all you'd been through? Um, it was a surreal moment. I felt both massive and tiny in the universe. I, I was a Saudi, I was born in a desert. I mean, I, and then I fell in love with mountains and then I was standing on the highest mountain in the world. And it, 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 I felt humbled to be able to prove to little girls that we are capable of doing whatever we dream of. It doesn't matter where you're born, whether you're Arab or not Arab or whatever. It, what matters is the conviction in your heart, and in our case, your family's um, understanding. I also really wanted a long shower, because two months of climbing, and you really don't <laughs> smell nice after that, and maybe six burgers, but <laughs> that moment was just, it made me realize that hopefully one day when I have daughters, I want them to be, to be able to dream, not to, not to go to the top of the mountain, but to go to the moon and to touch the sky. That's what I want one day, hopefully. Uh, Minky, I do think that there are people um, who say, okay, these countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, don't sponsor, don't support sports organizations for girls, for women. Why is it such a big deal? Why does it matter? Well, the rules of international sport are very clear. The Olympic Charter says that you're not allowed to discriminate against women or LGBT people. And I think this is one of the interesting openings that sport provides us. It's almost a kind of soft power, you could say. There's a, um, some of the worst governments in the world actually want to host the biggest events. Um, Beijing and Sochi were big Olympics. Qatar is going to host the World Cup. The Saudi government, in fact, wanted to host the Olympics. In January of 2015, the, they proposed that there would be a sex-segregated Olympics mm. hosted by, with the men uh, competing in Saudi Arabia and the women competing in Bahrain. That didn't go over well. <laughs> now, uh, you know, obviously this would be a setback for women's rights and actually men's rights too. Uh, but I think that does show that even uh, governments that are outliers in women's rights uh, do have things that they want from the sporting world mm -hmm. and Saudi Arabia has 13 million women and girls so that's um, the fact that they're effectively excluded from sport the fact that there are more than 155 sports federations in the country but only for men that that's just wrong mm -hmm. and it because as Raha has said before, there are, the schools are already sex segregated because, so they could introduce a curriculum with the stroke of a pen to have a physical education for women and girls. And that means that they would also then have other educational opportunities open to them. You could train to be a physical education instructor. You could train, you could go to business school and open gyms. You have sports marketing available to you, sports advertising. So if the women's rights arguments aren't going to work, if the play by the rules arguments aren't going to work, I think maybe it's time also to be creative and make both the health argument because... Um, what are the implications? What are the health implications I mean, of girls not being able to play sports? I mean, Miki has all the numbers. I, I have all the stories. I mean, you are, imagine a life where you are not allowed to play sports freely. 
and then you, you are forced to stop at a specific age, you're going to have a generation of, of, of young girls that have uh, brittle bone problem, diabetes, uh, they're overweight. It's it just... It's, and it's it, already happening. It's already happening. It's, it's just because of this issue of not seeing sports as an equal opportunity for girls and boys. Mm. I mean, for, for, I, I hope one day we reach a point where we can compete internationally. But let's start with what's the core issue, which is health. Mm -hmm. And it, that's, that's one of the biggest problems with the lack of sports for girls. Oh yeah, we have the stat right up there. 70% of Saudi women will face obesity and other health problems by 2022. It, I mean, this is, I have to say, a gulf-wide health problem. It's a problem for Saudi men. They're not as active as they should be, but uh, they don't have the restrictions. And your know, sport is a human right. To play sport affects your health. It, um, I think everyone in the room, we all take for granted the right to play sports. I was a child of Title IX, um, the great 1972 statute that said if you were going to give women, if you're going to give money to men's sports, you also have to give it to women's sports. So that means we all grew up taking the right to play sports for granted. But if you aren't able to, just think about what that means in a very practical sense. So maybe um, from the age of five or six, you're not allowed to play sports. There's no sports for you in schools. You, if you want, if you have aspirations to train to be a professional athlete, you have to leave the country. And that means that only the people who have money will have access to sports. So to that point, Raha, maybe you could tell us, you know, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. Um, it's not just the health issues and it's not just playing the sport. There are character building elements in playing a sport. What did you gain from that and what are people losing by not having those opportunities? I mean, uh, to, to, to grow up knowing what it feels like to win and to lose is something very important that a child needs to learn. To learn discipline, to learn to be able to play with your peers, to, to, to learn that you are only, a, you, the, the power of the team is only as, as the, the weakest link. Mm -hmm. If you don't have sports at all, how can you build these things? How can you build these, these, these characteristics that are, are tools that you take in your life, later in your life? There's right. no sports whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it, you, you end up with a, with a block that's missing in, in character building. Yeah. I'm sure everyone here remembers the first time they won something, or the first time they crossed the finish line, or the first medal, or the first moment they felt great. Mm -hmm. Sports is, is, is beyond just, just winning. It, it really builds your, your personality. You said this amazing thing. Um, it's a personal dream to see a generation of girls where there are no longer any firsts. I think our hopes and dreams for that world are the same as yours. But realistically, how do we create change in Saudi for girls? I think it's, it's in the, the heart of a parent, in terms of the mom and the dad, is, is the key to this riddle. Because if you change the mentality of sports being just for boys, with the argument that your girl will grow up to be healthier and happier, she needs to be active, you will unlock the potential. Mm. I don't think it should be like a blunt move, and we've talked about this so many times, it shouldn't be a blunt move where all, all schools or all ages, it should start small. Mm. Because I, I, we live in a society that's very, very traditional and won't accept new things. So the key is to make the parent, to educate the parent that this is not just about winning, it's about having a healthy child. Mm. And every parent wants to have a healthy child. So this is, the, this is the, 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 the point that we should try to focus on. Are those grassroots movements happening in different parts of the country? We, we have seen in the last couple of years uh, some amazing improvements, such as the appointment of Princess Rima bin Bandar, who I'm a, a personal friend and a huge fan of hers. She's been appointed as the head of female sports, mm. which is a big step. Uh, Vision 2030 also has a few points to improve, but, but unless we start with educating the parent and the importance of sport, you can put school, sports in all the schools and not a single girl will define her father, mm -hmm. because that's not how we're brought up. So it needs to be educating the parents for the importance of this. And then hopefully by the time I'm 80 or 100, we would have a few gold medalists, hopefully women, for Saudi Arabia, because that didn't show up yet. So hopefully one day I get to see that. I know that you've also been talking to young girls. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing right now? Um, I'm, I'm trying as much as I can to lead by example, to prove to all these little girls that I, that if I, as someone who's very average, who grew up in, in Saudi and is born in the desert, could manage to climb the highest mountains in the world, then your dreams are not too far from reach. Mm. You just really need to have the passion and conviction and the guts to tell your father, because that's, <laughs> it, this is part of our culture. But uh, if I exist, surely they exist. And I want, it, it kind of bothers me, it's a bittersweet that every time 
uh, Saudi athletes or female athletes come up in the news, I pop up. I do not want climbing Everest to be the most epitome of uh, Saudi female athleticism. Yeah. I want this to look like a footnote. I want us to go to the moon. I want it to look like nothing compared to what's the next generation mm -hmm. that's going to come up, hopefully. Yeah. How can we use sports as an entry point to advance human rights, not only in Saudi Arabia, but around the world? Well, I think it's a, um, so around the world there are sports federations, there, it's, a biz, it's a big business, um, there are sponsorships, and I think increasingly there's a recognition that ugly discrimination against women or against LGBT people shouldn't be part of the game, that it's not the rules of the game. I, I think there's a, um, there, is, there are women in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in Pakistan, and other countries who are claiming their right to play sports, and that's what's so inspirational. I think Raha, Raha's story is, um, is, is very special, but there are many other Saudi women and girls who aspire to be fencers or runners. There are women who are running marathons um, uh, legally, um, in full cover, uh, in very hot conditions. So I think um, increasingly there are companies uh, who, Nike for example, has um, devised a sport hijab. There are many other co yeah. companies yeah. that are making it possible. Just one word about that, um, you know, it's uh, the possibility, one of the things that sports federations can do, for example, is lift bans on hijabs. Right. So that would be if you're banning hijab in the sport like basketball, the International Basketball Federation currently bans it, then you're keeping a generation of women and girls out of that sport and away from healthy practices and a lifestyle. So it's there's some point. easy things that could be right. done to move the ball down the field for women's rights. And then just lastly, Rahab, um, I trust that there are young girls, not just in the US and Europe, but around the world, who are watching this or will be watching this online at a later date. What is your message to them? I have so much to say, but so little time. I mean, if a Saudi woman could touch the sky, you are capable of going beyond that. I really hope one day this looks like nothing. I really hope so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.